Thank you, everybody. Uh, as you may know, Troy and I do a FinTech podcast, Appetite for Disruption, and this is going to be recorded. We're going to do the first 20 minutes up here. That'll drop in about two weeks, and then we're going to go downstairs to the podcast booth and finish recording with Lou so that we can uh, get the other part of it in, and that will drop in four weeks. So uh, I'm Lee Schneider, Lou Kerner, Troy Paredes. Welcome to all of you. We hope that you will become avid listeners of the podcast. <laughs> Lou, thanks a lot for joining us today. Uh, we thought we'd spend a little bit of time talking about cryptocurrencies. And uh, I usually use the term blockchain tokens because I think of them as being potentially anything. But let's focus on cryptocurrencies and, and sort of how you got interested in them. Sure. Uh, I, got, I got interested originally in, uh, in 2013 um, when a good friend said, you know, asked me what I thought of uh, Bitcoin. And I said, I think it's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. <laughs> and he asked me, you know, how much of, you know, how much about it do you know? And I go, absolutely nothing. And he says, well, you know, I'm, I think I'm going all in. I think it's amazing. And if you get smart on it, I'd love to hear your opinion. And one of the uh, uh, first things I do when I want to learn about something is I have the pleasure of uh, getting the smartest people in the world on a conference call. Uh, to teach me about it because I can get, you know, hundreds of, of other people, you know, institutional investors on the call. And so I held my first call on Bitcoin in June of 2013. So where were you working at that point? Uh, at that time, I was uh, a VC. I had started a small fund. And so I was always interested in shiny objects and, and, and Bitcoin looked like it could be a shiny object. So what did you, you learn that made you change your mind? <laughs> from, from, from one of the stupidest things I ever heard to now being a huge proponent? Um, you know, to, to, to tell the truth, in 2013, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't learn much. I, you know, the funniest thing about that conference call, and it was with four guys who are all luminaries today, was um, the Wall Street Journal, of, over the last seven years, I've done more than 50 of these calls. Wow. That was the only call that I did uh, that the Wall Street Journal live blog. And they started the live blog by saying we're on a conference call, Bitcoin conference call being held by Lou Kerner, Wall Street's Bitcoin expert. <laughs> and so and when I knew so nothing. You, you, were, you were having the call because you were not the expert. Exactly, because I knew nothing. In your... <laughs> and uh, uh, and literally a month later, I was keynoting the biggest Bitcoin conference uh, called Bitcoin East wow. Uh, wow. at Javits Center. And I spent uh, about 20% of my time for about a year. I described it as I looked at the light and I looked at the light. And I met plenty of smart people you know, who were you know, obviously incredibly excited about Bitcoin, but uh, uh, I never actually saw the light in the first year. You know, I, I, I joked that it was obviously a lot dimmer then than it is today. Yep. And, um, and I kind of continued to watch it, but from afar. And then in June last year, when uh, uh, ICOs started going crazy, I held a, another conference call. And actually, I mean, I held two other conference calls in 13, 14. But in 17, in June 29th, I held a conference call uh, with four thought leaders on, on ICOs. And literally on that call, something one of the per people said, literally it was, uh, uh, I I've really felt like I saw the crypto light. And I stopped everything I was doing that day. And I said, I think for the rest of my life, 24 seven, I'm gonna be crypto. And that was nine months ago. And it's been, you know, the most exciting nine months of my life so from a business you're, perspective. If you were to describe the, the light that you saw, right, oh. that really made that, pivot for you happened. What, what was it? What was the light bulb that went off? You know, it, it, it was just kind of everything fell in place. Uh, and what I saw was, uh, believed was that there is these series of technologies, um, obviously blockchain at the core, but, you know, smart, smart contracts. And, and um, uh, you know, now I think it's also zero knowledge proof and enabling decentralization. Now it's also community. And it's these things all in combination. I thought we're going to have a greater impact, you know, multiples more than, than the internet. Yeah, well, uh, it, it's interesting that, that that was your big takeaway from it. W what got me to see the light was the fact that a blockchain token could be anything. It could be a digital representation of anything. And at first, that sounds sort of facile and maybe not really that important. But when you start to think about how that could entirely change commerce, it's, it's really profound. No, un undoubtedly, and I think that's, you know, smart contracts, right? If this, then that statement that's now can sit on top of these things, again, makes anything can be anything. And, so, and, so and the I, only limits the imagination. So I have to tell you a funny story. I was speaking at a conference at the Harvard Business School over the weekend, and my panel was on smart contracts. 
And right before the panel, I went to the vending machine and I bought a soda so that I could have something to drink while I was on the panel. And then they had each of us introduce themselves. And I said, my name is Lee Schneider. I just executed a smart contract by purchasing this soda from the vending machine. It wasn't a blockchain smart contract, <laughs> but it was still a smart contract. Did they get it? I, most people got it, but, but right, you have to simplify this stuff for people to that level so that they can, can become, so it can become more intuitive for them in order to really pick up on how big it can be. So on, on, on that real quick, just um, how, how enormous the impact could be, as, as you've talked to so many folks who have been active in so many different ways, what are some of the things that when you've seen by way of the applications, because one of the things that we talk a lot about on the podcast is exactly this point, which is, all right, how do you take these concepts and how do you, how do you explain them in ways where people can say, wow, I can see how that's going to make my life better, right? And yeah, so what are some of the things you've seen? It's, it's so hard. You know, it's, it's funny. From, from my own life, uh, uh, one of the things that I, that, that I talk about when people ask me about real-world applications um, and, and what I'm really looking forward to is, you know, I've, uh, I'm in the process of, uh, of getting divorced after a 25-year marriage. And uh, like it, almost everybody else who's gone to divorce, it's hell. It's horrible. And, um, you know, Amen. And, and, and I joke that, uh, uh, you know, I'm not sure if I'm ever going to get married again, but I'm, I'm positive if I do, it'll be on the blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> right? And, and, you know, we'll have a series of smart contracts. And if one day one of us wakes up and decides, you know, I want to add a Dodge, you know, instead of taking two or three years, it'll take two or three seconds. I, I completely <laughs> agree with, well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave your personal situation <laughs> aside, but I, I completely agree with this idea that um, having the technology which automatically executes things really can simplify the world. But one, one of the things that, that you know, we as lawyers think about is what are the actual contractual relationships that are created there? And uh, so, Troy, maybe you know, from your perspective as a lawyer, what do you think about it in terms of, well, the if-then statement is a contract, but thinking about it in the broader context? I think one of the big challenges is the same challenge you have with good old pen and paper contracts, which is the incompleteness of the ability to identify all the if-then conditions, uh, which is not to say that there's not real power. It's rather to say, all right, what is, you know, what is the limit in terms of how you identify right, the if-then conditions? But then there's another question which is, and I'd be curious on both of your thoughts on this, which is, all right, you have hardwired if-then conditions, but what if when the if-then condition occurs, you decide, you know what, on further reflection, you know what, right, the, the, I want to actually have it play itself out differently, the room for that flexibility. So one way to think about immutability is there's some beauty in it because things are, in fact, hardwired and they can't be played and mucked with. The other aspect of it is, is well, sometimes you don't want things hardwired and you want there to be some major of flexibility, and when you think about what lawyers do, they're often kind of hanging out in that gray space, and sometimes there's advantages to gray space, not always, but sometimes. So as you kind of factor that sort of stuff in, and you think about how is this all gonna actually play itself out, and will, be, will there be aspects where people do sit back and say, is that a little too hard and fast for my comfort, and what do you do about it? What, do, you, do you give thought to questions like that, either? Oh, sure, you know, of, of course. You know, one of the things when, when you enter into these smart contracts, right, you know, o over time, the world changes, yep. right? And that's why, you know, one of the, you know, the uh, favorite quotes is, is from Thomas Jefferson. Um, you know, in his memorial, it says, you know, the reason that the you know, that, that you have to be able to change the Constitution, you know, otherwise it would be like forcing a grown man to wear the coat that fit him as a little boy, right? So you, you never know how the world's going to change. And I think one of the, my, my guess is one of the things you're going to see is um, some kind of smart contract adjudication process right. that, you know, if in some way the world changes, from when you did the smart contract that you can go into some kind of you know, adjudication process to account for that. The interesting question along those lines too is once you start going down the, if the world's changed, is that really the way we'd want the smart contract to have executed itself? At what point have you lost a lot of the value of the if-then conditions? Right, you know, yeah, of, of course, none of these things are, are hard exactly. and fast, right? This is, yeah, I, I always say the most important word in the English language for almost anything is balance. 
right? Anything too far one way or the other, and it's more just, you know, where do you want to put that balance? Yep. And my guess is, is in the, you know, in the future smart contracts, there will be some balance that's gained from some kind of adjudication Do you have process. a view as to what that adjudication, I realize in early days in the grand scheme of things, but do you have a sense as to what you think that adjudication process ought to look like, the institutions that provide for that? Um, again, I think the, the, the smart, the, it's got to be something that's agreed upon, mm -hmm. right, before, you know, the, the, you know, in certain events that there are certain things, you know, one of the if this, then that is, you know, if, if this happens, then we can go to an, an, an adjudication process, and it will be a process that everybody's decided upon up front. Um, and it'll be, you know, my, my hope is, is right, that it'll be some kind of mediation and not be thrown into the courts, which is expensive and takes a long time. So, so do you think part of the appeal for blockchain and smart contracts is that people are, people always want to know what the future holds, and by having it pre-programmed, that allows people to know what the future holds? Um, you know, I, I think it's, I think that's a lot of it. Um, you know, the, the, the certainty about, um, you know, if, if you have an agreement Right, to make sure right, that the other person does what they're supposed to right. do um, without having to force them to do it, without having to sue them to do it. Um, you know, I, I think it's just going to fundamentally make the world a better place. Well, if you, can, if you can wring the cost of disputes and dispute resolution out of any system, <laughs> that, that in and of itself goes a long way. Set aside yeah. the point about sometimes you actually want things to be done a little differently on day two than you thought you wanted them to be done on day one. Fair enough, right? That's the adjudication point. But when in fact you want things to be resolved right in a particular in a particular way the ability to have that done expeditiously and of course certainty right certainty itself has its own inherent benefits because you can organize your affairs with respect to that certainty as compared to with with respect to uncertainty of what we've come to know as much of the dispute resolution process and, and i think that's a great point troy and, and it sort of goes to the the trustless world of blockchain and it's another element that allows blockchain to be trustless. So we, I think often we think about blockchain as being trustless because of the blocks and because of the record and you know what's happened in the past and all the transactions. So you know you have that digital asset. But I think part of the point that you're making is that trustlessness now extends out into the future a little bit and allows you to say, okay, things that are coming around later can also be trustless. And so that's, that the, those two pieces of it function together. Yeah, and I think you know, there's, there's always a lot of talk, uh, and obviously, you know, one of the beautiful things, you know, about, um, you know, about the, the just came from a, a talk on the, you know, tokenization of private assets, right? You know, one of the reasons that so many people, including myself, are so excited about that is the fact that, you know, now these assets become liquid. By right. definition, a liquid asset, the same asset when it's liquid, is worth more than when it's illiquid. And I think another value that we're going to get is from this certainty, right? I think people will pay uh, for certainty, and so you know, I think it'll create additional value just from having that smart contract that, that uh, uh, you know is going to be executed with certainty. So we may have some listeners, perhaps not in the audience <laughs> here, uh, but some, some listeners who you say tokenization of private assets, they're scratching their head a little bit. So the, the brief version of what that means with perhaps an example to make sure people really understand what the significance of that is. Sure. Well, you know, the, the, the simplest idea is, is in private companies. You know, today uh, you invest in a private company, whether you're a VC or you're an angel investor, you get a share in a company, and that isn't liquid. If you want to sell it, there's nobody out there to buy it, and, and um, so you've got to sit there and hold for, you know, often many years until there's some monetization event, uh, and you know, and if you invest in the company and they were doing A and then they pivot and they're doing B and you don't like that, it doesn't matter, you still have to hold on to it. But if that is tokenized and it's tradable on an exchange and there is demand on the other side, and that's a big if, um, because a lot of companies will tokenize and there won't be any demand on the other yep. side. So you know, just because you are tradable doesn't mean anybody's going to trade you. But, but uh, for, for companies that are able to create that demand and now there's liquidity, uh, I think that's a tremendous advantage. And it's not just the liquidity that's an advantage, but I think even what a security is going to be is going to, I think, blow people's minds. I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the simplest thing to think about, you know, I'm a shareholder in, in a lot of companies, um, even public companies, and, you know, all the shares that I own all have given me the ability to vote 
on what the company's gonna do. But I've never voted. But you know, that vote has value. Yep. And if it was tokenized, you could actually break apart the vote from the value, you know, from the rest of the security and sell that vote to somebody who values it. And so, you know, I think that's just kind of the beginning of, of how securities are gonna change when they're tokenized. Yeah, that's very cool. Uh, so since we're talking about liquidity, uh, do you trade cryptocurrencies yourself and on, on it on some of these cryptocurrency exchanges? And how do you find that process? Not, you know, I, I, I don't really trade. You know, I think there's actually a portfolio science. And so, you know, I invest on a, you know, on, on a regular basis, uh, you know, a small amount. And I, I equal weight it uh, uh, across, uh, you know, the, the biggest coins on Coinbase. Right. And that's, you know, uh, you know, outside of the investments that I do as a, as a VC. So, you know, obviously I'm all in on this space. Um, you know, that's what I tell, you know, how I tell everybody to invest, whether it's in crypto or in the stock market. Yeah, I, I, as a former equities market guy and Troy too, you know, you too, right? Yeah. It's so interesting to see the way these marketplaces are developing and some of the things that they're doing that are similar to the way the equity markets work, some of the things they're doing are different. The, just the sheer fact that it's 24-7 is crazy, right? Yeah, it's, I mean, you, you, you can't get away from it, and that's you know, one of the reasons why I have no interest in trading, right? Because if you did, I don't understand how traders just don't, you know, blow their heads off because, right, it's 24-7. Yeah. So, you know, even yeah. on the weekend at 10 p.m., you know, I, I'm my friends, you know, they're checking out, the, you know, where Bitcoin is because it's moved in the last five minutes. <laughs> I, I had to discipline myself. I, I'm only allowed to check my account once a day now. Because uh, otherwise, it's exactly the same thing. Yeah. It's exactly the same thing. One of the things, I think we only have a little bit of time um, left here, but one of the things you mentioned early on in terms of seeing the light, you mentioned community. And that's come up um, on our podcast from some other folks as well. Uh, when, you, when you reference community, uh, what, do you have in, what do you have in mind? What are you getting at there? You know, I think that's really one of the fundamental differences between crypto and everything that happened before is now, obviously, instead of, the, you know, uh, in Facebook, uh, you know, the shareholders, you know, now have $500 billion of value and the users, you know, have, you know, nothing but their identity stolen, right? You know, and I mean, they might get some value from it, but they don't get monetary value. Yep. Um, you know, in crypto, uh, obviously, you know, your, your customers um, can buy the coins and now, they're part of the community, and whether they're participating in Telegram or Reddit or, or elsewhere, um, or they're developers, uh, they can be part of what helps the company be successful by them participating, by them telling other people to get involved, um, by them writing code to help make your product better. Um, you know, uh, uh, the companies can be stronger, and the participants in the community can, you know, can, can become very wealthy, right? That's what we've seen from the Bitcoin community, from the Ethereum community. And I think that that's, you know, that that's really unique, and I think we're just scratching uh, the beginning of, of how powerful a community can be and the difference it can make between success and failure. Do, do you have a sense as you look out beyond scratching the surface on that as to what that power may be and how it may manifest itself? You know, it's, 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 it's a great question, and that's really one of the things that I'm, I'm incredibly excited about because, um, you know, how you engage, and I think, you know, we're, we're right now, most of the work that's been done on community has been done to have a successful ICO. And then once right. the ICO is done, now the company actually has to execute on a whole bunch of different things, and most don't really dedicate the resources to continuing to grow their community and engage their community. And I think, you know, similar to how when companies go public, they have an investor relations department to continue to grow the investor base and continue to inform people. And I think that's one of the things you're gonna see evolve in this industry is kind of community relations businesses that help companies post ICO continue to, to, to grow and engage their communities. And, and that was a point that we'd been making to our clients for a year now. Is, is, has anybody listened? Uh, <laughs> you know, some people listen. But, but, but realistically speaking, if you can't obtain those network effects, then your token doesn't go anywhere, your blockchain doesn't go anywhere, and everything fails, right? So the best way to do that is to develop that community and make sure that people are participating and feel engaged. Yeah, and, you know, and one of the interesting things, too, is you know, obviously one of the things different about crypto and, you know, and you know, decentralized um, you know, entities is the ability to fork. Right, and so you know how you engage your community 
uh, that's now forking. Right. Right. And so, you know, and right. everybody's trying to get the community to come over to, you know, the, to their side of the fork. And, uh, you know, I think quite often the, the community that's left after fork uh, is actually even more important uh, to, to the ongoing success of the project. And what you said, is that that just as an empirical matter, that's been what you've observed? Do you think there's something about the process of forking that, that, that yields that result? Well, I think it makes people choose sides who are part of the community. I think it makes people, you know, forces them to get more engaged to understand what's going on so that they can make an informed decision about which way they want to go. Um, you know, and, yeah, it's, uh, uh, again, I think we, we're all at the very beginning of this, but I think over time you're going to see a lot of innovation in community building. <laughs> where we are. So, I, Lou, why don't you just uh, finish up any last thoughts for the group here, and then we'll head downstairs and we'll record the other half of the session, which people will listen to later. <laughs> uh, just so you know, I'll, I'll start the last thought with uh, uh, the first thought that I often have is, you know, I continue to believe, uh, you know, I saw the crypto light on June 29th, yeah. and, and every day since then I've become more convinced that crypto is the biggest thing to happen in the history of humanity. So that's a pretty big claim, biggest thing. So, so <laughs> yeah, other people say penicillin. I realize other yeah, exactly. things have happened, but <laughs> so if I'm wasn't, sticking with it. Somebody wasn't going to listen to part two of this. They they now they, they now have the perfect lead in why they got to come back and listen to part two yeah, in terms right. of uh, <laughs> the biggest thing to happen in uh, in human history. Anyway, this is uh, this has been great, and we'll look forward to continuing the conversation in a few minutes. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, Lou. Okay, terrific. Right, thanks, we'll see guys. you downstairs right. in a few minutes. Cool. Thanks, everyone.